I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and I, I was born in 1929. Um, no one even knows that, that number. When somebody says your date and birth, I go 1929, and I see them go, you know, the year of the crash. We were working class striving for middle class, which I think is a very common American story. The nationality, I don't know, you know, we were mutts. It's Irish, Scotch, Indian. But the interesting part was there was part Native American. But no, no one talked about that. that. That wasn't honored at all. That would be like being part black. So we were just Scotch, Irish, English, probably a little German. I mean, and there was Native American. And of course, I would love to know more about that, but nobody had any record. The women in my family were the pioneers that crossed the country to settle the, you know, the West. And so it looks like we kind of got halfway across and ended up in Kansas. But these women, they, they fought alongside their men. They knew how to handle a gun. They could handle the livestock. My grandmother, I mean, who, I didn't know her, but my mother tell, would, tell, uh, would tell us this story, and, and my little brothers and, and my, so we go, tell the story about the mama pig, tell the story about the mama pig. And so she was on the farm, she was probably around five years old, and she had two other sisters and a brother, and the brother and the dad got in this, the covered wagon or the wagon, and had to go into town to buy supplies. And that was like a four-day trip, so the women were left on the farm alone to manage everything. Not a problem. So at one point in the middle of the night, the mama pig was ah, raising a racket. And so they all went out, my grandmother went outside and she took a lantern, and she, so sure enough, there was this, this mountain line up on the, branch of the tree that was close to the pig pen and there were baby pigs in it. And that mama pig was not going to let that uh, lion get near her baby pigs. And she was raised up on her hind legs and just, I mean, fight. And so my grandmother goes back in and gets the shotgun and sets the lantern down, takes aim, and she saw the light in the eyes of the, of the mountain lion. And bluey! And dull thud. She goes back in the house and everyone goes to sleep. In the morning when the men come back, they see this, this mountain lion lying next to the pig pen with a bullet hole right between his eyes. And I thought, yeah, Granny, give him hell. <laughs> My mother, Bessie, really didn't have a mother because she was at that time around five years old, and her mother, my grandmother, maternal, uh, died of tuberculosis. They couldn't deal with it in, in, during that period. So she was actually raised by her sisters. She had three older sisters. And so that gave her a lot of freedom. I mean, they, you know, it's not exactly like a mother and a child. These are the sisters. They're busy doing their thing. So my mother, her name is, everyone called her Bessie. She was pretty much on her own, and that was marvelous. No one was watching her, guiding her, telling her what to do, so she got to use her own intelligence to figure things out. And she figured out that sitting on the butter churn felt good. <laughs> so she remembered, clearly remembered masturbating as a, as a child. And that's why she was so lenient with, you know, with all of us. That was never a problem. There's something about being more natural, and because she didn't have schooling, I think she made it to the third or the fourth grade in a, you know, one-room schoolhouse. It, she had to walk two miles to get there, bad weather, so it's like she just barely learned to read and write. And, and it's another thing, that your her mind wasn't filled with memorization or the, you know, the names of the presidents or the states or any of that stuff. So she had what I would call native intelligence. She was so grounded. Wow, I had a great mother. She thought masturbation was a natural activity for children. Everyone called my mother Bessie. 
She had such a great sense of humor. We were always laughing. You could always talk to her about sex, and she had a, she had a very easy way of t dealing with it. She was orgasmic, I later found out with my father, and to her, sex was just a natural thing, we like eating and sleeping and, you know, d dancing. It was natural. So <laughs> you could always come to my house and we would have sex conversations and my girlfriends could ask her questions because it wasn't such a big deal because most of their parents were religious. This is, come on, Wichita, it's got like all kinds of born-again Christians and very rigid and all that. So they come over to my house and we'd have these marvelous sex talks and laugh and laugh and laugh. So, yeah, so she was like the oracle for, the, for my whole household and all my friends. I grew up with my father and my mother and a whole bunch of other grown-ups singing barbershop harmony. And it's just like you hear in the barbershop where the guys would get together and you'd have a lead and you'd have a tenor and you'd have a baritone and you'd have a bass and they'd start singing down by the old mill stream. And that harmony was so close that the hairs on the back of your neck would stand up. And of course, I got uh, uh, invited to, when the, the, uh, no one else was around, I was invited to lead a song and my mother and dad would harmonize and sometimes we'd get my brother and I learned to do the baritone and, you know, we, I grew up singing, absolutely, and it was, you know, back in those days we didn't have television, so you had to make your own, you made your own entertainment, and it's, there was something kind of wonderful about that. And they'd be sitting around this little metal table in the kitchen, which was a tiny room, but it really echoed. <laughs> it was like a sound, little sound room. And they'd be someone sitting on the sink, someone on the stove, someone on this, you know, the chair, and then and a bottle of bourbon in the center of the table and the ashtray loaded with cigarettes. Everyone was smoking and drinking. And it was like, yeah, that was Saturday night. I don't. I've never. I never saw this, but I had it, my my cousin told me that at, they would have these. Um, the name of the organization was the SPEBSQSA. Now, don't ask me how I remember that. SPEBSQS, the Society for the Preservation and Cons Conservation of Barbershop Singing in America. Now, back in the what forties, this was a big organization, and they had their gatherings and etc and so the all the quartets from all over the country would meet there and my dad always had his quartet and sometimes the uh, tenor I can eat I can even see him uh, couldn't make it and th so they'd go up on the stage and 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 you'd start to hear the I mean I wasn't there, but my cousin told me this. You, they, the audience would say, Bessie, Bessie, Bessie. And mother would go up on the stage, and they she was a little bitty woman. She was five foot one, and she was kind of round, and she had a very pretty face, and she had a little Sarah, Clara Bow mouth, pretty little thing. And she was very feminine. And uh, she'd get up there with these three men, and blast out that harmony. Her voice was powerful. And of course, it was wonderful to see this little round woman blasting harmony with these guys. And she was as good as they were, if not a little better. And it, everyone went crazy. They loved Bessie. My first job was running the elevator in Hinkle's department store. <laughs> I was underage, but I looked more sophisticated, so they let me do it. The really first job that that you know that was I impressed me was when I was working uh, as a fashion illustrator, but as a as an apprentice. You see, apprenticeship is how we used to learn things. You would go and be with the person that did the work, and they would teach you, or you would imitate them. So I was apprenticed to the commercial artist in Hinkle's department store. And I'd sit there and I'd watch what she'd do. And every now and then they'd give me a little drawing to do, a tablecloth or a lamp or some simple thing. And then I would see how she was doing it. And we were working with chemicals that made reproduction easier. And I can't even remember the name of what they called it, but it was like, when I ended up going to college for the first year in, at Wichita U, 
I took a commercial art course, and the instructor didn't know anything about commercial art, had no idea how it was reproduced, and I was telling him, and that's when I got it. School? <sighs> Give me a break. I know more than the damn instructor, so I dropped out and, and, and went to work full time. It was a good move. I was making, just before I came to New York and at the age of 19, I was making a little bit more than my dad. And if I recall correctly, the number was $65 a week. That was a good salary. And I wanted more because I knew how much I was doing. And I went in and asked for a raise. And I, they, they laughed at me because I was so young, you know, and... So I, I walked out of the, uh, the, the department, I, I walked. I said, if you don't give me, I'm gonna. So I went and I set my little drawing board up in my bedroom and I was working freelance. And this is when I was like 18. I mean, I, so if they wanted me to draw something, they had to come all the way out to where I lived and give me the job. So finally the newspaper hired me back and I got my raise. And I think that was really the last time I was bold. <laughs> because it was so awful. I mean, I was punished, and they... Anyway, <sighs> then I came to New York, and I had just turned 20. All the time I was working at the, at the department store, the way we were learning how to do commercial art is that we were imitating two stores, B. Altman and Lord and & Taylor. And the artwork for Lord and Taylor and for B. Altman were quite different, but they were they, those women were good. I'm I, I'm pretty sure they were women who did the artwork. Of course, no one knew their names. I still wouldn't. I could probably figure out to today. But what was so wonderful about copying, I I kind of like the woman who did B. Altman better. The Lord and Taylor would get kind of carried away, but B. Altman was solid and. Boy, that woman knew about light and dark and shadow and building form and, and all of these things I found out later when I went to art school. So I will remember when I first came to New York, my father's younger brother lived here. He was also a sign painter, and he was doing the signs that were in, in front of the um, Broadway plays. They, you know, come on. They, everything was done by hand in, in, during that period. This is, I came here in 1950. So these big uh, displays out in front of Broadway, my uncle, Uncle Howard, he was doing all that stuff. So <laughs> when I went to see Uncle Howard, he was devastated. He didn't want some young, hot little chick running around New York. He was very conservative. They came from a little town in Kansas. He wasn't religious, but he had his set ideas about women and our proper role and our proper place. And he said, why didn't one of your brothers come instead of you? This is like he was like, oh. So I thought in my mind, I said, fuck you. I thought, wait till I'm, I, and I was, I'm, I was gonna show him. And I did, I did. So <laughs> we're, the first night we're together, he's moaning and, you know, uh, uh, and he said, you've got to go to art school. New York is a very competitive city. And this work is not, it, it's not, and I thought, what is he talking about? I'm, as, I'm, I'm better than most of the, I had a very high opinion of myself. So he said, what do you like, classical or modern? And I went, classical or modern? I had no idea what he was talking about. So I thought for a while and I said, well, I don't know if the artist for Lord and Taylor would be called modern and the artist for B. Altman would be called classical, but I kind of had a feeling that was the way it was going to come down. And he looked at me, and he didn't believe it. I didn't know the difference. I had never seen painting. I'd never been inside of an art museum. I'd never looked at a book. I was pure, <laughs> pure. So he went, oh, and I'll never forget that groan. Oh, my God. But giving him credit, he put me, he enrolled me in the National Academy of Design for night classes. And that's when I started my art schooling. And from that moment on, he paid for that one semester. I went through four more years of art schooling on scholarships. 
my mother was all for my leaving and going to New York she because she wanted to run away with the circus to get away and she wanted to get out of this little Anderson, Missouri where she was. <laughs> so when I started talking about moving to New York, she never ever put a damper on it. She, she knew that it would be very exciting and good for me. My dad was a big baby. He cried. He don't Betty Ann, I don't. Well, and then I look back on it and I was putting a lot of money into the house and helping the car payments and because I was making a good salary for a young girl back in those days. That was, when was it? 1950? Big difference, big difference now and then. When I came to New York in 1950, of course I was, you know, fashion, fashion, with the hairdo and the dresses and the makeup and all of that. I was very, very femme. I went to art school at night in my high heels, can you imagine? New York was beautiful then. It was very livable. It was a beautiful, clean, lovely city. But, oh my God, when it came for me to get a bank account or, or, or rent an apartment, I stayed at the... Um, the YWCA, which was the studio club for young women who were going to go into acting or art or whatever. And I did that for quite a while. And I couldn't get an apartment because I didn't have any bank account. And so I thought, well, I've got to get a bank account. So I don't remember how I got a bank. I put it, I deposited, I think, $100, which was the most amount of money in the world. I came to New York with $400 in my pocket. And in my mind, oh, that was a fortune, a fortune. And I knew I'd get all settled. But uh, the money ran out. I was down to nothing. I think I had $20 left. And oh, I borrowed $20 from one of the girls in the studio club. And I had an appointment to see this uh, advertising agency that wanted a freelance artist. And I show up. And I didn't know what freelance meant, but they wanted to know if I would be their freelance artist. And I said yes, and I thought, well, I'll figure out what that means later. And they gave me a drawing board and a space over in the corner of the studio. I thought they were going to pay me. No, they pay by the job. So the first job that came in, oh, this is what I was doing back in Wichita. I mean, I knocked it right out. And boy, did they pour work on me. And it was like every little piece, you had bill for every little piece. It was, ugh. First of all, Wichita was, you know, it's a little, it was a cow town. And people were very polite. And everyone smiled. And we said hello to everyone on the street. And I come to New York and I'm smiling. And guys are hitting on me right and left. And I finally figured it out. Keep a very straight face, straight ahead, and scowl just a little bit. And they didn't, you know, and then, and I had to learn to say, I'm not interested, go away. I'm not, because right away I went blonde because I saw, you know, I was living with my girlfriend Joni and her mother, they were very kind of rich Jews up on Riverside Drive, and wow, was I soaking it up. She had blonde hair, and I said, How do you do that? You go to the beauty parlor, and they, right away. I'm a blonde on top of everything else with high heels and a cute little body and all dressed to the nines and wondering why everyone is hitting on me. It, I mean, it's talk about learning the hard way. It wasn't before long that I cut all my hair off, wore sneakers, jeans, a big floppy shirt, and got into art school. It was just like I left femme way far behind. but. For that first year or two, I was femme up to the, you know, eyeballs. A young girl at 20 moving to a, a city like New York, all of my mother's friends were saying, oh, Bess, you know she's going to be a prostitute. If she isn't married the first couple of months that she's there, she will be a prostitute. And I, my mother, she just, you know, Bessie, she was a duck. God, she was a dynamite woman. She just fluffed him off. She said, I'm not worried about Betty Ann. She'll, she knows how to take care of herself. And that was the truth. I did know how to take care of myself, thanks to her. With this none of this overprotection, I knew the deal. I got it immediately. You know, off went the blonde, off went the makeup, got the sneakers, stopped looking all kind of glam. 
first I had to have an unplanned pregnancy. I was madly in love with Tommy. It was just like, oh. And I was using, um, it was a um, spermicidal jelly that you injected inside. That, and that was it. There was no air. And so finally, my girlfriend said, you have to get a diaphragm. But in order to get a diaphragm, you had to be engaged. So she loaned me her engagement ring, and I went, I'm called, I had, you have to call the gynecologist, made the appointment, went in, and he was, you know, how was, you know, you know, congratulated me for getting married, and I got fitted for the diaphragm, blah, blah. It's just, you know, it was not easy to get a diaphragm then. But, it, but it, it was the answer. And I went all through the sexual revolution having sex with thousands of people with no problem at all. My first art school was the National Academy, and we were drawing from, from the nude model with a charcoal stick. And it was mostly, it was a night class, so you had a lot of dilettantes, in other words, older people who were now drawing just for a hobby. But we also had about four serious art students, and we kind of hung together, and I was the only woman. And I remember one time I was sitting there with my hand on my hip, and Herb looked over at me and said, don't do that, you look like a girl. And I went, oh, I am a girl. That's interesting. But they didn't treat me like one. I was one of the boys. I grew up with brothers. So it was very good for a girl not to be too girl, if you're going to be in a situation like this. I was one of the guys. But then when I got older and I wanted to be a painter, that we'd go down to Cedars, this the bar in the village where all the, you know, Jackson Pollock and all the big names were hanging out. And they were just a bunch of crazy drunks. I tell you, I look back on that and I think, ha, huh, did I show them? Not that they'll ever know, but I didn't like abstract expressionism. I thought it was bullshit, still do. And I thought, okay, because they made fun of me. I was drawing the classical nude. And I thought, this is the kind of training I want. I want to learn to draw the human body. Once you can do that, you can do anything. The discipline it takes to learn how to draw the classical nude will set you up for any kind of a job or career or profession that you choose. So it turns out for me, it's teaching sex ed. But that discipline, oh, God, it was fabulous. Oh, no, I wasn't an artist. That was, I, you know, they, I mean, I was a dilettante. They, I was puttering around until I got married and settled down and had a family. That was it. In the 50s, that is what women did. They did not have careers and live alone. Oh, I couldn't get a, a, I couldn't get an apartment. I couldn't sign a lease. I couldn't get a loan from the bank. I couldn't do any of those things. I had to borrow money from my uncle. One time I borrowed it from a girlfriend. <laughs> then I got a check, finally got a checking account, which was very, my parents didn't have checking accounts. I don't, you know, it's like, so one weekend, well, that happened quite a few weekends, I ran out of money and I needed to buy some food and I used to buy these little pound cakes and, and maybe a piece of fruit and that would get me through the weekend. And I'd write out a check for $3. <laughs> and one day the banker called me over, and the guy behind the teller, and he said, you know, Betty, it, it's really a big nuisance when you write these small checks that bounce. He said, what would be better is just come in here and I'll loan you 5 or $10. I was mortified. I never did that, but I stopped writing small. You know, I figured out how to put $10 aside for the weekend instead of spending it. My husband was a, was a very sweet man. He was a little dull, and he was a premature ejaculator. That was the big problem. And we even went to a therapist together, and they don't know anything about sex. And the only thing I learned when we went to a therapist is that he said to the therapist, she's always wanting sex. She's always demanding more sex, and it turns me off. And she looks, she goes, oh, Betty, you can't do that. That doesn't work. No man wants that. You can't demand that. And I said, well... He comes so fast that I have to, we have to do it again or, you know. Of course, nobody at that point would say masturbate or, you know, get yourself off or go get, a, go get a lover who can keep it up. I mean, it was just like my fault. And I thought, fuck therapy. Ugh. 
she's on his side. Oh, and they did. They loved each other. So I knew I had to get out of the marriage. Now, it was, I was in for at this like five, six years, and I thought, ah, I felt so badly because I knew it was going to just break his heart. He was, ah, I didn't know. I had to. I had to get out. Then I thought, well, I have, that means I have to support myself again. I'd had, by the time I bailed out, it was seven years. It was a seven-year marriage, and during that time, thank you, Fred, I was able to paint full-time. So I was in my art studio painting full-time, and we moved into this apartment with all the furniture. So I had, I had a beautiful home. I had gorgeous furniture. We had lovely parties, and I had my beautiful art studio on 29th Street with the skylight, and it was just all for my art. Talk about perfection. You'd think that would have been it, and I would just go for it. I didn't, I didn't want to live without partner sex. I really didn't. I mean, I was masturbating like a fiend in the studio, and so I didn't need him for my orgasms anymore, but I missed I missed heterosexuality. I missed fucking. I missed the penis. It's terrible. I hate to admit it. It was a part of my life that I really enjoyed. So uh, one time he came home and he said, I'm going to take up golf. And I turned to him and I said, I'm going to take up sex. And he stopped and I stopped and we looked at each other. And I knew he was telling the truth and he knew I was telling the truth. And not long afterwards, I said, we got to do this. And he said, I know. He knew I was unhappy. About, I don't know, several weeks later, he comes home. It's now my birthday, and we're going to my favorite Japanese restaurant for my birthday. And he's sitting there, and he says, Betty, I have something to tell you that's going. It's very difficult. I don't know how to say it. I just And he's miserable, and he's like moaning. And I said, Fred, say it. I fell in love with my secretary. And I go, what? And half of me is going, oh, thank God, I'm out. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. And the half of me is going, oh, oh, I've given you the best years of my life. You know what I mean? I had, I don't know why, I played the femme role while my other side is going, oh, finally I'm out of this. Well, I had to do that for his family and everybody and our friends because we were the ideal couple. And it was just, and I never, I didn't want to really hurt his feelings. Tell, you know, I, I could have said, look, I was ready to bail out myself. That would have been the kind thing to do. But I made him suffer. I poured on the guilt. But then he's Jewish and the guilt was good. That was good for him. They need to feel guilty and get over the guilt. So the thing that I will always appreciate Fred for is that I said, don't worry, I'll move back into the studio and you can have everything. You have the apartment and all the furniture because you paid for it, it's yours. No, 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 I won't hear of it. He said, I want you to continue to live the way you've been living. I don't want to take anything away from you, so I'm going to give you enough money every month to pay both rents and, and something left over so that you will. Back in those days, you could live in New York City with two rents, what was it? $500 a month? I think back on that and it doesn't sound real. It doesn't sound realistic. The rent here was $175.53. $175.53. And the art studio was like, I don't know, $75 a month. <laughs> and food, it wasn't that expensive. In the middle of New York, you'd think, no, everything. I could live on $500 a month budgeting. And of course, I would do an occasional, you know, freelance job. I would sell a painting, and I'd, I'd have a whoa. I'd sell a painting for three thousand. Boy, I'm living high on the hog now, and it's just what a wonderful time that was. And Fred, we were always friends. I mean, he was a good guy, and I liked him. He, I would, you know, and I loved to have martinis with him. Boy, we'd get. I'll never forget the time I fell off a bar stool. You know, I like to laugh, ha ha ha, and I just. That was a French restaurant that they asked us not to come back again. It was his favorite. So after Fred and I got divorced, uh, we stayed in touch. You know, he, I liked him a lot. We would go out and have a drink together. And um, then his next wife that he married was an insane, jealous idiot. And he could never contact me ever again. 
And so he said, Betty, I can't talk to you. I can't. And I said, don't ever call here. She just, and I thought, oh, my God, that poor man, he was such a bottom. So he ended up in the hospital dying. I don't know what he was dying with. And he calls me, and he says, I'm in the hospital, and I've been really sick. And I said, Fred, I'm sorry to hear that. And he says, now you understand if she walks in the room, I'm going to have to hang up very quickly. And I went, uh, Marge. So I said, I understand, I understand. And so we talked a little bit, and I said, you know, as soon as you get out of the hospital, we're going to sneak out. She'll never know. And we're going to go and have a martini together. Because I said, I had so much fun with you. And he said, my marriage to you is the best part of my whole life. We had a ball. And then a few days later, some a, a cousin called and said Fred died. And I mean, I'm living my life, and I didn't even have a t time to mourn or anything because I'm plowing ahead. But... I will always honor him for letting me or insisting I keep this apartment because this is a rent-controlled apartment and it serves my purpose so completely with this square room. You know, when he, I, got, I wasn't doing workshops when we got divorced. I had no idea that I was going to end up doing it. People walk in here and they say, oh, this place is fabulous, basically an empty room. And nobody has a living room that has emptiness in it or open space in it you know your family we all grew up with coffee tables and end tables and that's how I had it furnished I had furniture all over this place so you weave in and out of furniture and wow thank you Fred thank you thank you for insisting I keep this apartment so during the time that everybody is doing abstract expressionism I am drawing the classical nude well, where is this going to take me? One day in my studio, I drew two people having sex. And I would hire models. And I tried to hire a couple to pose for me. And it was so awkward. And they were so uptight. And I was so uptight. So at this point, I'm dating Grant. And he loves photography. He has his own camera. He has his own dark room. He always had everything. So I said, could we take some pictures of us having sex and I can draw from me. Oh, he loved it. So I, my first series of, of, I mean, I wanted to draw sex. That was what I was interested in. I wanted to, I wanted my nudes to have sex. So <laughs> I had a drawing of uh, a man going down on a woman and it was, I, I do the pages were 29 by 30, 36, something like that. But it was a nice size. It was about like this. And they were the perfect size to hang on your wall. And I had a couple of the drawings sitting up along the edge of my art studio. And this one model comes in, he goes, oh, those are fabulous. And he said, "I'm, can I bring a gallery down here to look at this? And so the gallery owner comes in and he was this rotund, very expressive, and at the time I didn't understand gay or anything. He was an old queen uh, from the opera, and he goes, oh, this is magnificent. I loved him. And he said, I'm going to, you know, he put me in a, a, a an exhibition of um, a mixed group sex, group exhibition, and everyone loved my work, so he gave me a, a one-woman show. This is 1960, 68. And so I had to get busy, and I did, I don't know, six or seven, which I called the love picture exhibition. So I had position A, position B, woman on top. I had oral sex. I had 69. I had a handful of very basic sex positions. The show was a magnificent success. Everybody loved it. It was just, he sold, I would, he sold almost half of all the drawings, which was like, my God, my career, my fine art career, I'm on, I'm, go I'm happening, I'm thrilled out of my skull. And at the same time, I'm starting to kind of get involved with feminism because it was right at the time, the end of the 60s, that the women's movement, we were like, you could feel the energy, it was shifting, women were coming alive, we were asking questions, and I thought, I'm in on this. I'm Oh, I was very excited about the women's movement. So the first exhibition. And so now, in 1970, so that was 68. 1970, I'm ready for my next exhibition. 
And it took me along, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I, I really should do drawings of group sex, but I couldn't. It was too complicated. And I, was, I had mixed feelings about it because, because I would go to these parties and the women were all faking orgasm. I could tell. Ah, ah, ah. You, I mean, you could sense it wasn't real. And I thought, oh, oh, this is terrible. Women are faking orgasm. I was doing the real deal. Thank you, Grant Taylor. And it was just like, it was so shocking to me that I thought, oh, I've got to get involved. I've got, women have got to know, this is, ten, you know, I, it was not, mm -mm. women not having orgasms, that was the worst thing in the world I could think of, how, how terrible that was. So I decided that my next exhibition would be Classical nudes, masturbating. What was I thinking? And they were six feet. They were over life size. I had a woman doing manual, looking at porn. I had another woman with a vibrator, and it was the old-fashioned oster that fit on the back of your hand. She had a vibrator on her clit. Then I had John masturbating with a pillow between his legs. And then I had Romil, my black lover, who had a... Oh, a beautiful penis, and he was beaten off. Those were four pretty powerful drawings. And, and I told my um, gallery, I told Louie, I said, this is what I'm going to do. And he said, oh, yeah, that's fine. And he was maybe not paying attention. So he came down to the gallery, and he saw the one of the woman with the hand and looking at porn, which was probably the most, the easiest one. And when the day of the, of the show, I brought my, you know, hired the truck. It, this whole exhibition was so painful. Everything, every, everywhere I turned, it's like at the framers. I mean, everybody was trying to ignore the fact that these people were masturbating. Now, I knew that was, everyone does it. I did it. My Everyone I know did it. Why is this such, everyone was like, <laughs> but the fucking, no one said, oh, that was fine. They were beautiful. I sold them all. So, the gallery director, he looks and he says, no, 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 we can't do this. This will ruin my reputation. Forget it. No, no. We're not hanging them. And I, so I called Grant and I said, what am I going to do? He's not going to, and I, and I said, I'm going to pull the show. And he said, Betty, if you're going to pull the show, you have to call a trucking company and have them ready. And I hated details like that. God, I just wanted to make the threat. And he kept pumping. He said, a threat is worthless unless you have your backup information how you're going to carry through. And I, God damn it. So I did. I got on the phone. I had a trucking company. You know, I, had, I, I, I have four six-foot framed nudes, you know, paintings, drawings, that it will have to be transported this afternoon, maybe. Could I call you? on short notice. Yes, they said I could. So then I went back and I had told the gallery director, I said, I'm pulling the whole show if you're not hanging it. He went apeshit. So I had to sit there while this man had this hysterical outbreak and he had this little assistant. Oh God, he was so mean to him. And he was a hysterical queen is what he was. And I just sat there waiting until he got over it and I said, well, What's your decision, Louie? I'm waiting. I've got the truck waiting. I, you know, I'm all, it's, it's, I just have to make a phone call. So he said, well, hang the woman in the main gallery, and we'll hang one of the men in the back room, and the, you have to fill the rest of it in with just classical nudes. And so that meant I had to go back and get a bunch of other... But anyway, the show went on with the one six-foot drawing of the woman with the vibrator on her clitoris, Jackie. And it was, it was so not worth it. <laughs> but at the time, <sighs> I was burning with a hard gem-like flame. I knew I was righteous. And people would walk into the gallery and they'd, oh, and some of them left. And, and it wasn't nearly as celebratory as it was with the fucking drawings. And at one point, I'm standing there, and of course, women were coming up to me. What is that? She's, what's that? I said, that's a vibrator. And they go, oh. 
well, I can't ever do that. I'd never stop that. I'd get addicted to that. And I said, yeah, it's fine. You'll lose weight. You'll be happier. You won't eat as much. Get a vibrator. And, of course, that was before vibrators. <laughs> and there was, at one point, there was this little old man, and he looked at me, and he started to, his eyes narrowed. He was a little bit bigger than me. And he says, I know who you are. And he started coming towards me, menacing like, and, and he said, you are the devil. And his wife said, Harold, get back over here. And of course, because <laughs> I was sizing him up, I said, I can take him. I mean, you grow up with brothers. The idea of physical confrontation with a man didn't scare me. And I think that's very important because women get very like, you know, I have to be protected by a man. Hell no. I took a lot of big guys down. When I was darling and dating, they'd all want to have sex. I ended up with a wrestling match on the floor. I always won. You, I know how to pin him. I fought dirty. Pinch, kick, grab, hair, whatever. So after that, I was drummed out of the, <laughs> out of the gallery business. Nobody wanted to, you know. I lost the gallery. It cost me money. Uh, no, I didn't sell anything. Now I had a bad reputation, and not one feminist showed up, and that was the whole point. A few days later, I was like really kind of, oh, God, it cost me money. I didn't sell anything. What, what is wrong with me? Then I stopped, and I thought, I got it. Masturbation is the foundation of all sex. That's it. If a woman can't masturbate, she's not going to have an orgasm. She doesn't know her body. She does. So I said, that's what I got to do. I got to focus on masturbation. And then I ended up writing an article about it for Ms. Magazine. And they, you know, oh, I wrote, I had several things that, you know, the men's magazines would deal with me and they would reproduce the masturbating woman, not the guys. They never reproduced the guys masturbating. Oh, no, 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 no. They loved the idea of watching a woman do herself, naturally. Of course, I wanted to put Romy out there with that big black dick and make them all nervous and penis envy. So it was just, it was the beginning of my, uh, I don't know, I guess you could call it my masturbation crusade <laughs> to liberate masturbation. At the end of the 60s into the 70s, Saturday night was group sex. It wasn't going to a movie or eating in a restaurant or playing bridge. It was like sex. It was the most wonderful, wonderful phase in American history. And I don't think a lot of people know about America's sexual revolution. It was on, kids. It was on. And we were like, whoa. Whoop de doo life is worth living. I mean, you know, it was just, it was incredible. So going to these parties, and I had a lot of them here, this was really my preparation for doing the, the workshops. This is actually my true PhD in sexology, watching people have sex. You can't, you can't learn any other way. You can't read it in a book. And when I was aware of all of the faking that women were doing, to please the men, and the guys were all like, uh, getting down, breathing, uh, 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 and the women were like, ah, 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 you know, fixing our hair and making sure our makeup was okay, and oh, it was it just it broke my heart. So I knew I had I had to. My feminist commitment was going to be to teach women how to have orgasms. How? I mean, when I looked at the, how. And I remember Grant saying to me, he was this smart old guy, he said, well, Betty Ann, why don't you consider your own progression? Your own, how did you learn? What happened for you? So bring it right back. And of course, at that same time, feminism was saying first person, use first person. And he's saying, use your own, use your own, ex ex yourself as an example. And I went, yeah. So what was, what were my, my steps my breakthrough to become fully sexual with myself and with partners. Well, it was certainly learning that I wasn't genitally deformed. You can't go around enjoying sex if you think there's something wrong with your sex organ. So that was number one. And then the next one was, well, uh, 
what is your best form of stimulation? Well, obviously, I had to do my clitoris. And what about your childhood? Oh, I had orgasms with myself throughout my whole childhood. So it's just using my own experience as the grounding of what to teach. And then feminism comes along with, we have to do I sentences. Start every sentence with I. Don't go you. The minute you go you, it's like mother, school, the teacher, everyone stiffens up and they don't want to hear it. If you simply say, I really had the same situation and so this is the basis of consciousness raising that feminism went grassroots. It was incredible. I loved it. And all you had to do was bring a group of your girlfriends together once a week, once a month, whatever worked for you, and go around the circle and share your story with I sentences, first person. And I, so I had, I had gone to, I don't know, a couple of different consciousness raising groups. It's a terrible word, consciousness raising. So CR groups is what we ended up calling them. And this is how I learned what was going on in the world and how it affected me listening to other women talk. Because I wasn't going to get this out of a book. I wasn't going to get this from a history, you know, lesson. It was listening to what was going on in women's lives. So then it became clear to me. I am going to do physical and sexual consciousness raising. As I think back over this, it's just, wow. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to manage this? How am I going to manage that? And then it all comes back to, what did you do? What happened to you? How did you manage? What, where does that come from? And at that point in my feminism, I had pretty much, you know, put men on the side. You know, I sent them over here. I wasn't dating that much. I was going to these meetings. I was hanging out with Sheila. I had a, a buddy. She was my feminist buddy, and we, we went to sex parties together. We weren't lovers, lovers. We were fuck buddies. <laughs> and that's what the gay guys were talking about. So, And I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense because I don't want to be in love because I know what that involves. Ugh, oh, my God, it's a can of worms. So uh, the lesbians were complaining about my relationship with Sheila. We, we don't get any sense of, of erotica or any sense of sensuality. And when you talk about, you know, and I thought, oh, go fuck yourself. You're, we were too male identified. And that's what we wanted. Because the guys were having so much more fun than the women. Oh, the women, they had to pair off, be in love, and nobody even knows what that is, and go steady, and then move in together, and then have this awful fight and break up and repeat the same boring pattern again and again and again ad nauseum. So Sheila and I were fuck buddies. We had sex in groups. We had sex with other people. We didn't exactly... I didn't want to give her an orgasm, and I didn't want her to give me one. We got our own orgasms. So that's when I learned about partner-assisted. Partner-assisted masturbation is hot, baby. It's hot. I have the vibrator on my clit, or the guy's got his dick, and then the partner does things that enhances. So you might do a little nipple play. You might do a little pull on your testicles or get your finger inside her vagina or her anus and just add to her pleasure, but the person who is masturbating is in control of the primary sex organ, whichever that is. And it's like, oh, it's, you know you're going to have an orgasm, and it's better than what you can do by yourself because you've got two extra hands. Wow. We both were so into vibrators that, and of course we didn't have cordless then. <laughs> oh, we would have ripped them up then. So we would take our vibrators to a sex party, and, and it would end up being a demo, which was fine because people needed to get the information, and so we were happy to accommodate. We would put on a little sex show. During the group sex parties, which were in this the main living room, and we had a little table over there with uh, an urn of coffee, uh, some sugar, little cookies, and some nuts, a little protein, and maybe some fruit, no drugs, no alcohol, and at that time, pot wasn't, you know, like everywhere. So 
we were basically using sex energy and nothing else. So we'd have it here in the living room, and there was always the double beds in the back pushed together, and that's where the main action was. And eventually towards the end of the evening or early morning, the guys would all end up out here in the living room around the food eating and talking about sports and the stock market, and the women would stay in the back room. And, of course, I had the vibrators available, and we would start vibrating and supporting each other's orgasm. So there'd be a little nipple play. There'd be a little buddy hole. It was like, and, oh, the energy was just like, wow. When it was all women, it was quite different. It wasn't, it wasn't like driven. It was more leisure, uh, easy. It was more, it was more playful. We would be laughing. And you can't laugh with a guy because he thinks you're laughing at him. So it's just, every now and then a man would drift in and look at the, oh, and he'd watch a little while and then he'd back out because something special was happening with women only. And you know, that's ancient stuff. That's, that goes, that's, that's way back when, when we were in charge. And I'm sure the reason we lost control was that we abused our power like what's happening today. The men are abusing their power, so that's why we have to take over again. So the, the sex parties was my PhD. You learn, by, you learn about sex by doing sex. You can't read about it because that doesn't get it. So I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to teach women about orgasm. And I think, well, it's got something to do with, you know, the women in the back room and the vibrators. And, and I come out here and I look at my, I had Louis Says and the chair and a half and the little coffee tables with the marble tops. And I mean, this was Sloan, that fancy furniture store on Fifth Avenue. My poor husband was paying for that forever. And the table in the dining room, and it was, I was set up, oh, the Oriental rug, of course. And I thought, if I emptied this room, I could run workshops here. Then I thought, wow. God, Fred just ended up paying all this. The furniture was very expensive. So I got on the phone and I said, Fred, would you like to have all of the furniture that you bought when we were married? And he said, Betty, why? You need that. You keep it. And I said, no. I want to empty the living room. And he, we talked about it. He said, you're crazy. This is, doesn't make sense. And I said, please, do you want it? And he said, well, yes. I think he was still maybe paying for it. I don't know. It was, he probably was. He's still making payments. So he agreed, and a truck came, and all of the furniture was put on the truck and took it out to Long Island where he had a house and a wife with one child, which is, was he, he got what he wanted, I got what I wanted, and he put it in the basement, the furniture. And if I was smart, I would have sold it. But I walk into the living room, and I sit down in the middle of the floor, and I look around, and I have an empty room. And I went, oh, God, I've lost my mind. What have I done? And then it came to me. It's a blank canvas. I'm going to start a new career. And then it was just like, <sighs> that was the answer. I'm starting a new career, and they are going to be women's workshops, and it's going to be right here in this space. So I got to get a rug. I borrowed some money. I got carpeting in this room. It was brown, earth, you know, grounded. And I got on the phone, and I started calling everyone I know. And, it, you know, and it was like, I had no idea. And I said, Sheila, you're going to help me with this. She said, yes, yes, we'll do it together. We'll, I'll. So we just, it, was, it just came together very organically. It was an, an amazing experience when I look back on it. And so at, in those early stages, I mean, we were just trying a whole lot of stuff to find out how it was going to work. And at one point, uh, the peop one of the women said to me, well, what does an orgasm look like? And I went, well, you're talking to somebody who loses her eyeballs. Yes, if you don't know what it looks like, how do you know? And certainly it's not porn, because porn is all, the, you know, come on, girlfriend, get, give me some excitement. Ah, 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 
they just go nuts, and the guys, oh, God, the guys love it. The more they scream and the louder they are, the more the guys love it because they're having an effect on her, I think. If I make noise when I'm coming, that way I'm going to... I'm going to lose it all together. You have to go inside your body. You have to focus. You have to get into your breathing. It's a completely different trip when you're having a real orgasm. So she says, what does an orgasm look like? And I looked at Sheila, and she looked at me, and I said, we're going to do a demonstration. So she was always up for anything. So we were over there in that corner, and we plug in our vibrators, and we lay down, and we started. So here, it was perfect, because Sheila's technique, or her process, she hardly moved anything. She was very, she's very quiet. She's very internal. And I was more expressive. I breathed more, and I moved more, and I made more sound, but not screaming. And so she had her silent, and, and her stomach muscles would do that. And it was like, and you knew she had an orgasm. And I would, uh, 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 but not much louder than that. So they got to see two different kinds of orgasms. And I remember one time we had popcorn, and the women were, <laughs> and it was popcorn all over the floor, and so we stopped doing popcorn. But they loved it, and at the end they all clapped, and I looked over and I thought, we just did our first live sex show. And we laughed about that. We thought that was hilarious. We put on a live sex show. So then that was, you know, we did that a few times, and I, well, it's limited. Now they should all master that. Finally, I came to the place where I thought we should all be masturbating in, in the circle, and that way we could see each other having an orgasm, and it's all different. We're all different. It's not the same. We don't move the same. We don't sound the same. We don't look the same. So and then I, so then the first time I did the, the circle masturbation, oh, God, my heart was like, I thought, I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to die. How can I deal with this? How can I handle this kind of energy? It's a lot. It's a lot to ask because, you know, every now and then a woman would break down. Oh, I can't do this. And you have to take her in the back room and calm her down. And then what do you do with these? You know, it was just a, it was a lot. You know, women are not easy to deal with. It's like, a, it's like herding cats. You know, give me guys and dogs, and it's like very simple. They, they mind, they do what they're told, but women, oh, God, hysteria and this, everything else. So we get everyone calmed down again, and I needed them to look when we stood, so I got them to stand up. So we would start standing up, and I learned at that point the one thing that got everyone grounded was humor. So I'd start acting like a goofball. I'd be playing my vibrator, you know, getting down, doing a Jimi Hendrix, and, and you know, and then doing all these crazy movements. And then, ah! <laughs> as soon as you laugh, you let go of your tension and your fear. So I was really pumping humor. That was a stand-up comic for five, six, ten women. And then they, it would get going, and then everybody would lay down, and, and I'd say, now, erotic recess, Go, go inside yourself, and they would, and, you, and the room would get very quiet, and then you'd hear, uh, uh, uh. and the real sounds, the authentic sounds, were so much better than all the screaming and drama that porn gives us. It was no comparison, and it was so hot. And I remember one time we were in the circle for like four hours. I thought, we're just going to keep masturbating until we turn into a puddle of sex energy. <laughs> so it was like, the first time I also thought, I had these images of, you know, what is it? I'm going to hear this bang, bang, bang on the front door, and there's going to be this big Irish cop. What's going on in here? And I thought, where does that come from? The fear of doing this. So I went through all of the standard scary things that everybody goes through when you're breaking all the rules when it comes to sex. We all have it. We've all been brainwashed, totally brainwashed. Sex takes place between lovers, a boy and a girl, in a bed when you are in love. Now, everyone knows that, and I'm saying, bullshit. That's not the good stuff. One of the early workshops, the very early ones, we were sitting around talking, and 
I think I brought it up. I mentioned something about, well, listen, you think that's a problem. I have these long inner lips that, you know, that dangle in my neighbor down the hall. Joan, she goes, oh, I have the same thing. And then she looks, and then I look, and then we look at each other, and then I look over, and there's two other women looking. And then I had to go get another mirror, and we all started. It's totally spontaneous, absolutely spontaneous. I did not think that up. It was so... It was so incredible. So her inner lips were even longer than mine, which, I don't know, I kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. And then I thought, Dodson, are you a size queen? What is this? <laughs> Get back, Loretta. And the other thing is she had a much bigger clit. And, we, and I thought, well, of course we're all different, but we don't see each other. Genitals show and tell. And then I realized that it, it couldn't just be that we're all hanging out doing it, you know, with, it had to be ritualized. Everything had to be a ritual. So I thought, okay, I would sit down with the mirror and, and the, the, she'd sit next to me and it would be like a guided ritual. I always went first. I like the concept that a general, a good general, never asks his troops to do anything that he won't do. So I would always go first. I always went first. And by doing that, I gave everyone else in the room permission to do it with me. And she'd come and sit down next to me. And here's where my art comes in. I would give her a guided tour of her of her sex organ. Look at the beautiful form. Look at this shape. Look at this. It's, this is fluted. This is like art deco. Oh, look at all the arches. Art gothic. Darling, you're totally gothic. And then the inner lips, you know, some like are ruffled. And I said, oh, Baroque. You are so Baroque. That is perfect example. And we would laugh and have fun. And they'd say, well, what style am I, you know? And I guess I decided I was the Madonna because the clit is the head and then the inner lips are the, are the, are the goddess's robe, whatever. And, and, of course, Sheila was modern. She shaved every bit of hair off her pussy. It was, and, and this is way long before we were doing, you know, bikinis and Brazils and all that stuff. It's now quite common. And so oh, it was quite shocking to see a, a vulva without any hair. It was, oh, so she was our modern our modern vulva, and it was so much fun. Oh, God, it was fun, and it's and exciting, and 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 erotic in a good way. Not erotic like I want to fuck you and we want to fuck each other. It's like erotic in the sense that we were being filled with sex energy that was very positive. Show and tell. It's been part of every workshop ever since. Well, when I was doing the body sex throughout, you know, the 70s and the 80s, at one point, I wore my hip joints out. I couldn't get up and down off the floor anymore, so I had to go get hip replacement. And I thought, Betty, you've got to stop with the workshops. I wasn't going to ever do anything else. And I went, I don't know, 10 years without it, without doing them. And it was just like there was this big, oh, this big empty thing in my body that it's just I miss the women I miss the energy I missed everything that we were doing and we weren't we weren't progressing and uh, this is how you have to teach sex you have to teach sex by doing sex you can't read a book you can't look at a diagram so I thought I've got to start up again and besides I was flat broke and it's a, and, and it's a modest income so I started doing the workshops again and it just lifted my spirits completely and it is the way to teach sex. Now, I even did three men's groups, and totally, it was a big, huge success, except at the end of that weekend, I was drained because it's very difficult to get men, straight men. I had two gay guys. It was just like everybody's terrified of being homosexual. The, that level of fear in mankind is so pathetic. It is just, and I, I, it took me two weeks to recover from doing that men's group, and I thought, no, I can't work with men. They just drain all of my energy. You guys have just got to figure it out on your own. And I went right back to women, because, it, because that's very uplifting. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do workshops until my last day on earth, because it is just... And I know even now I kind of come in and everybody wants to know, look at that old lady, is she going to be able to get up and down off the floor? And they always want to help me. No, you can't help me. 
because I have a system. I roll over and I get on my hands and knees and then I maybe take a hold of something and I pull myself up and then I stand straight uh, and I'm okay. So yeah, I'm slowing down. <laughs> I'm 87. And I think, well, should I get a chair? I could, but no, I want to get down on the floor. I want to be the same level as the women. So right now, at 87, I'm still doing it. And I will continue to do it until I can no longer physically do it. Then I'll sit in a chair and still do it. You know, after those exhibitions where I, I got that the visual was really very powerful, but I needed words. I needed words to go with it. And what happened when I did that little article for Ms. Magazine, it turned out to be two pages, and I worked with an editor on that for months, writing, writing. And I kept saying, I told Gwen, I said, I don't know how to write. I'm an artist. I'm not a writer. I'm not an author. I don't know punctuation. I can't spell. He said, Betty. Every author has an editor. So he said, I'll be your editor. So boy, was he pushing me to write. And I kept thinking, you know, a painting goes in someone's house or a museum, and there it is, and that's it. And just a handful of people get to see it. But if you write something, it can go in magazines and newspapers, and people read it. And I thought, I've got to write. I've got to learn how to write. And he said, you don't have to learn anything. Write like you talk. Oh. He said, like you're writing a letter. Okay. I never had writer's block. I never worried about misspelling. I never worried about sentence structure. I never worried about anything. I was simply telling you what I was thinking at the time, like how I would talk. And it turns out, I'm a hell of a, of a writer. I, I'm a great author. I mean, people like how I write. They like what I say. So it's not about style. It's about content. Ah, when are people going to learn that? Content is queen. If you are saying something that's real and important, doesn't matter how you say it. It really isn't that important. And because when I first started writing, I wanted to write like the New Yorker with these fancy words. And that they start, you know, first they start, uh, they, they do fast forward and then they come back. And, and that's when I started to write my, my memoir that way. And somebody said, I, it's too confusing. I don't know what's going on. And then I went, linear, do it progressive, step by step. Don't get fancy, Dodson, like you're telling the story. And that's what my memoir is like. And everybody says, wow, you're really a good writer. And I'm going, ho, 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 ho. I'm an artist. I guess it's just another form of expression, words, images, pictures. When the 70s feminism was taking off, it was the energy in New York was incredible. The women were just, we were like, because uh, we got, we were on the verge of something very big. And, uh, and I, how am I going to break into this? I mean, it, was, it seemed to be like some kind of a sorority. And, of course, I was already wounded from my first year in college. I didn't get into the sorority I wanted in the sorority. It's, and women can be so cruel. Oh, God, it's terrible. So how do I do? How do I, how do I break into being a feminist? And one day the phone rang. And it was Harriet Lyons, who was an editor at Ms. Magazine. And she said, Betty... Would you write an article about masturbation? We have this guy, whatever his name is, who wrote, an, who wrote a book about it. And he said, he's the guy. There's got to make a difference if it's a woman. And I said, yes, yes, I will. I'll write an article. Oh, you bet I will. I will. Ah. And the reason she called me was that Barney Rossett, bless his heart, who had um, Evergreen, and that was kind of a hip, uh, radical in magazine with all the you know mostly men who were making waves back in the in the in the seventies, and he had an uh, uh, he had an interview with me. I got to pick who interviewed me. I had a woman, and then I had Grant in on the whole thing. And the interview was brilliant because I had control over the whole thing. Grant had control over the whole thing. And Grant played the role that Carlin now plays with me. That they, they, it's uh, the linear thinking, and they they stack it up and they set it up because I'm all over the place. Uh, you know, I'm a circle, 
and they would like block it out. And then we had all of these little images of my erotic art. That article put me on the map, and that's when Ms. Magazine saw it. So it's like, that was my big break. Thank you, Barney. I think he's left the planet, but wherever you are, darling, I will always appreciate that moment. So Ms. Magazine was a, collect a, collect a collective. It was like a whole group of editors. And you get a group of women together and try to agree on something. So Harriet and I did, I don't know, a hundred revisions. I was in San Francisco and I was going back and forth. I was bi-coastal and we'd talk on the phone and all this was going on. And I thought, oh, finally, finally, the original article, the, you know, my manifesto was put on the shelf for two years because they were afraid if they talked about masturbation, they would lose subscriptions. Now, maybe that was accurate, I don't know, but that was not my experience. Every time I talked about masturbation openly and without embarrassment, everybody felt better. But they were being very fucking conservative. In retrospect, I think the government might have had something to do with it, but that's me understanding more than most people about what really is going on on planet Earth. So masturbation was too radical. It would free women up too much. It was like, oh, no, this is... You're, ahead, you're way ahead of yourself. Step back, Loretta. So two, two years, two and a half years, and then we start the process of editing. Oh, my God. We did, I can't remember, we did 10, 15 re-edits, 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 because you've got a group. You're not having one woman. You're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group of women that have to all agree. Finally, August 1973. And that's my birthday month. It was like a birthday gift. They're put, they're, and so it, they boiled it down to a page and a half. It was under two pages. And I got to the magazine, and, and of course it was in the back. They always put sex in the back of the magazine when it's the thing that everybody really wants. But there was a picture of me, and it was not bad, and I'm happy laughing, and I turn the page, and there's a picture of me doing yoga, nude, I was doing the fish, you know, with my head back. And I thought, wow, I'm in love with everybody at Ms. Magazine, and I start reading. It's short, but the main points were there. And Harriet says, oh, God, I've lost touch with her. She's, she was a, she was a, no, she was a trooper. That's a, she was the five-star general at Ms. Magazine. I don't, that poor woman, what she had to go through with all the, oh my God, we don't think it's, that no, it's too, it's too extreme, it's too extreme. No, oh, people, turn women off. I can just hear them. She stood her ground. She stood her ground. She says, well, men are talking about it. Why can't women? And, you know, we have this book on there. So she says, Betty, let's test the market. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. And she said, at the end of the article, we'll put anyone who is interested in the full, because it was a 17-page manifesto, boiled down to two pages. Whoever, uh, whomever wants to, you know, the whole full 17-page manifesto, uh, art, uh, article, the full article, send $3 into Ms. and we'll send it to you. So I went, cool, I got that. And we'll see how many women send, send in for it. Because I figured, what, 100, 200? I know how to mimeograph. We, you know, in feminism, we were always running the mimeograph machine. And I said, I can do that. And I would take the 17 page, the full thing, and I would run maybe 100, 200 copies and mail them out. That was my image. I'm at the time in San Francisco. And so Harriet says, uh, Are you sure you can do it? And I said, Yeah, come on, it's not a problem. Checks, the three dollar checks started pouring in across the country. Three dollar checks, and in each check was a letter from the woman pouring her heart out about how confused she was about how do I have an orgasm? I have no idea. Bah, bah, bah. I always thought that that was a terrible thing to do. I have terrible guilt feelings about it. Was just it's the experience I have today answering questions from the kids. It breaks your heart to know that somebody is struggling 
with something that basic. It'd be like, how can I eat? How can I feed myself? I don't understand what's nutritious. I'm starving to death. So I go, oh, I called Harry. I said, I've got to do more than, than, a, than that. I, they deserve more. The book I was going to write now, I got to do it now. And I went, how do you write a book? So I said, tell the women that by next October, there, a, a booklet will be in the mail. And she said, are you sure you can do this? And I said, yes, I can do it. Had no idea. So I went and got on one of my friends in San I said, what do you do when you write a book? And he says, well, how many pages do you want it to be? How many pages? I don't know. Small, a, a small book. And then he said, go find one that looks like what you think. So I get these little samples, and I'm looking at them. And I think, I can get this done in 100 pages. And I don't need more than 100 pages. And I like the size of this one little book about raw food that we got when we were at Ann Wigmore's. It was like a crazy thing. And, I, and it's not going to be any bigger than this. This is perfect size. And so I'm, I'm working with this guy, Michael, who was the one in, who invented credit cards. I can't think of his last name. But in San Francisco, everything was cooking. And so he said, well, then you've got it. Now all you have to do is write it, write it, and get it printed, and you're in business. So I was sure I could do that by the end of August. And... I'm thinking, Harriet, I've left her dangling in New York. I'm in San Francisco having the time of my life. But I go to work, and I said to myself, first thing, Betty, first thing, that the 15 drawings of female genitals that I did with pen and ink, that is the heart of my book. Women will see actual variety of female genitals. So the word goes out, everyone in San Francisco is lining up to get a pussy portrait and they know I'm going to do the drawing. So I have the phones ringing off the hook, and one of my roommates takes over, and they come in, and I, you know, sit there, and I photograph. And first, I photograph some, and some actually posed straight off. And I'm, I'm drawing, I'm drawing vulvas, drawing vulvas, and I'm using pen and ink because it's the most demanding. And if you get it right when you're doing pen and ink, it's powerful. So I have 15 pen and ink drawings of different women's vulvas. Whew, that's the centerfold. Now, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't matter what I say. That is, boom, that's the heart, the heart of the book. So then I think, well, I'll tell my story. So it's just first person, like what we were doing back in the day, and I start writing away longhand. I didn't know how to type. And I hired a couple of people. My friends in San Francisco had a little business they did little advertising things here and there. And Bill and KT came on board, and just, magically, this little booklet came together. Then we had to print it. And I will never forget when we were standing the printers, and the first sheets start coming off the printing press. It's like, and I went, God. Now, I'm a fucking publisher. <laughs> I'm an independent feminist publisher. So from art to writing to being a publisher, I'm out of my mind. It is, but I am on a, I'm on a high. I'm, I'm floating. I'm above, I'm above. So I have to, back to New York. So at one time, Harriet calls me and I said to her, that poor woman, I say, these checks are pouring in. I mean, I've got hundreds of these little $3 checks. What am I going to do with them? My bank's in New York. And I hear her go, oh, Betty, they have banks in San Francisco. Oh, go open an account. And I went, oh. And I realized that I was so panic-stricken. I was operating on a very primitive level. Sure, I went down the hall. I was living in the Castro. I go down the hill. There's the Hibernia blank, but I walk in, and I've got this bag filled with hundreds of $3 checks. So I walk in, and I, go, and I want to open an account, and I, there's this wonderful woman. She was round and jolly. She reminded me of my mother. And I said, I have a lot of checks I want to deposit. And she said, oh. And I emptied the bag on her, and there's this pile of $3 checks. And she said, well, what is this for? And I said, it's a book I wrote for 
and they advertised it in Ms. Magazine and now everybody, and she said, well, what is it about? And I said, it's about masturbation. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. She, I mean, she was in the gay ghetto. I mean, we were all, this is Castro Street in the 70s. It was heaven. So the energy, and that energy was in my book, and it was like sex was the most wonderful, important thing on the planet, and it belonged to everybody, gay, straight, bi, weird, queer, whatever, all the L, B, G, G, ba, ba, D, D, except I never noticed that they ever said just heterosexual. What happens to us? God forbid. Are we included? No, I think it has, you have to be a lesbian or a bisexual, or a, and don't get me started. So here I am, now an independent publisher, and I know I've got to get back to New York. But in the meantime, I have to get somebody who can type so I can keep track of the checks. And so, so I said to Bill, I said, well, what am I going to do? I've seen that people started writing in. Universities wanted copies. They wanted, you know, 12 co copies of Liberating Masturbation. Uh, <laughs> he says, you write an invoice. What's an invoice? I I, and he looks and he goes, oh, God. Then he explained it. So I was tacking up. We were living in a, an attic that had wood walls and thumb tacking. I was, money's owed me, thumb tack, money's owed me. I said, what do I do with all these? Send them an invoice. Well, it's, this was just way beyond me. So I said, I'm not going to do that. And he says, what do you mean? I said, it's too complicated. It's cash. He said, nobody does the book business with cash. And I said, well, I'm going to start. I have broken all the rules, and I'm going to break this one. If you don't send me cash, I won't send you a book. And it worked. Everybody sent in the $3, and it was so much easier than writing a check and keeping an invoice. And, and if they wanted more than that, they had to write it down and include the check. Cash. I did a cash business. Wow. The first time I went to uh, uh, Silomar, this big, huge conference place, and I mean, and I had short cropped hair and my snake boots and, you know, dungarees, weak jeans, and, you know, hot little top. And I, great body. And I went to this with my girlfriend said, take these, the people, these are all psychologists, they'll eat your book up alive. So I had a whole box of my books. It's like, what, 350 books? I said, I, her name was Betty. I said, Betty, I'm never going to sell that many. She said, just take them. And she drove me up in her car, and we had it in the trunk, and I had my little table, and I had a jar. Uh, no, I didn't have a jar. I just, me sitting at the table with a couple of books, and I had the, the rest of them down here. Three dollars, three dollars. I was putting in my boots, I was putting it in my shoulders, I put it in my pockets, and somebody brought me a jar, and I started putting, stuffing money in the jar, and, you know, it was like, whoa. <laughs> it's like, it blew my mind. Because here was all this money coming in for something that I'd done several months ago. Wow. What a concept. So I think I don't know. I sold a whole box or two boxes. Of, I sold a box with orders for another, added up to another box. In other words, I had a big success on my hands. Back to New York, and I took the back rooms. I got rid of the beds, gave them to a friend. And I made an office back there against that wall where I now have a bed again. So I thought, this is great. The two beds together that used to be the center where I had all of the sex orgies, the sex parties, that was all that sex energy was focused there. That's where I set up my business. And I thought, this is going to, I can do this. This is going to work. And I had Andrew. I had my little friend. He came in and I said, because he could type. I, I needed people that could type. By the way, today I can touch type. And I'm 60 words a minute, and I'll be typing away, and I'll look at the computer, and I'll see these words coming up, and I go, oh, and I am amazed. It just, life is wonderful. So I was an independent feminist publisher, and I sold, for 10 years, I sold 150,000 copies of that little booklet. It was a hand job. Into the envelope get the sponge, close it up, put the stamp on, put it into my little shopping cart, fill up the shopping cart, and I'd take it over to the P.O., and it was like little wobbly, <laughs> that little shopping cart. Oh, got it. Was a, it did a hell of a job. 150,000 copies went out of the local post office here, and 
every time a book went out, in my mind, it was another orgasm for another woman. And that was so rewarding. Lo and behold, <laughs> yes, over a period of time, that little booklet turned into Sex for One, which became a million dollar bestseller. It just, it boggles my mind. It just, with all the different foreign editions and Liberating Masturbation is now worldwide. It's astonishing, astonishing, yeah. Dell Williams, who had the, the sex shop on 57th Street called Eve's Garden, she was a dynamo in her youth. I mean, she was a high-powered Madison Avenue uh, 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 copywriter and all the, you know, right in there, in the heart of it. And she had this little apartment on 57th Street, and then she opened up the store in this, you know, in the building next door, in a, in a, bus in a business <laughs> office building. And when Della and I first met, I loved her, and she loved me, and she was great. She was, she was absolutely a go-getter. So she called me up, and she said, Betty, I want you to get involved in this big feminist uh, conference that we're having. And I said, what is it? And she said, well, we're going to have this big conference, and, and uh, you know, and I just want to know what you, what you would like to do. And she was very into now the organization and everything feminist, and she and she was a real organizer. She really and the, that was back in the day. And I said, I'll th I'll think about it. And I said, What would I do? And what would I, next time she called me, okay, what am I going to tell them, the planning committee, what you that what you're going to do? And I said, I'm going to do a slideshow of Split Beaver for feminists. And she went, Well, they're never going to go for that. <laughs> and so I said, All right, but that's basically what it is. I will think of a a better name. So it turned out to be creating an aesthetic for the female genitals. Fine. So the day of the conference, I had Sunday, I had the Sunday slot when the whole conference came together. And during the first day of the conference, I was in a workshop called Vibrators for Sex. No one knew much about vibrators. I mean, Grant got that thing on the back of his hand because it was going to save his life, otherwise I was going to fuck him to death. And I was using that, and then we found another one that was even kind of easier to use, and they were only sold in men's barber supply shops for barber shops, men's barber shop supply stores, because they were used to uh, keep the men from going bald. I mean, evidently, men going bald is a terrible thing for them. It's like their dicks are dropping off or something. So <laughs> I had the... Um, I don't know what kind of a vibrator I had. I had the panabrator, which was a big, you know, wand-like. And then I had the oster, which fit on the back of your hand. And then I had this little mean thing with a cup on it that was the prelude. And I had a box of whichever one of them with me. And I had them laid out on a table. And my workshop, the workshop about vibrators for orgasms, well, it was packed and it was out in the hallway everybody was you know wanting to find out what this was about so I had them laid out and they were plugged in and the women would come in and go ooh and I said put it on your pussy and they go oh my god and so boom boom I sold out instantly gone all the vibrators gone and so I kept saying be sure to show up for the Sunday uh, I'm, I'm giving a presentation that is very special so Sunday, I had both men and women that, you know, I had the main, the main forum. And, you know, how, how do I feel about all of this? You know, getting up in front of a huge audience, oh, I break out into sweat when I first started talking. My voice was, <laughs> and then after, I don't know, after a minute or so, I was like, <clears throat> I was on. It was not a problem. But I did. I was just like this fluttery, terrified feeling, and my mother always wanted me to be on stage. And here I am on stage doing the most outrageous thing possible, and I'm a nervous wreck until I start talking. Then you can't shut me up. So I'm going to present slideshow, Split Beaver for Feminists, only I couldn't say that because women are very proper. 
So I said, I'm showing you a slideshow of the female genitals. So I had this big six foot screen behind me and boom, the first one comes up and I say, this one is an art deco cunt. Then we went to, this one is a Renaissance cunt. And by the time I got to the third deco or the fourth Gothic, there's this Butch Dyke in the front row stands up and says, we object to you using that word. And I, and then I remembered Ann Selma. She said, the, the, the worst hecklers are the lesbians. And I said, no. She said, I'm telling you. And I remember when she said that. So I straightened up and I said, I'm sorry the word offends you, but it happens to turn me on and I'm going to continue to use it. Cunt, 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 cunt. I cunted the whole audience out for the next 90 slides. And it was just like, at the end, the whole room stood up and applauded. And I stood there on the stage and I remember this, it's like tingles all over my, I was having a psychological orgasm on the stage with this positive energy coming. I said, the women's movement has just become cunt positive. Wrong. <laughs> Women can be so heartbreaking, disappointing. We are so magnificent and stubborn. So I didn't change anybody's mind except a handful, and I suppose over a period of time, gradually. But here's the thing with teaching. Each new generation comes with the baggage. So now we are teaching the new generation. Here I am, 100 years later, still teaching the same thing. These little girls are writing into me, the teenagers. There's something wrong with me. I have these things that hang down. They don't know how to search for information. They don't know how to talk about it. The school system isn't dealing with it. Nobody is dealing with genital shame. Nobody, except DotsonandRoss.com. That's where you go to get your information, DotsonandRoss.com. Throughout all of this, every time people, and of course everybody wants to know, you're a group of women masturbating together. Every film company, every TV station, every magazine editor wanted to come here to get this, but no one could deal with it. I mean, I had a few of them come in, but they couldn't show this. They could HBO, it was ridiculous. You couldn't tell what was going on. You couldn't see group nudity. God forbid you'd see titties. Well, if you can't see titties, you sure as hell can't see a pussy. And, oh, the vibrator's on a pussy. Ah! No, it was just, it was such a disaster. So I stopped letting anyone come in to do anything with the workshop or my work because it, does, it wasn't working, that no one could deal with it. So it was all this titillation, superficial bullshit is what it was. So I said, no finished. No, I'm sorry. You can't, no, you can't film. No, no, uh -uh, no, I'm not interested. Thank you very much. Hang up the phone. And every time I'd write an article or be put up for a talk for something, I'd say, okay. And I'd send it in, censored, or they would bring the camera crew here and they would interview me and I would do this whole thing. It never showed up. They called me in for makers. Yes, well, I'm a big part of the feminist movement. You bet your sweet ass I am. And so I go there, we do there, and then we do the whole, and Carlin's sitting there, and she's, because I have a tendency to go off and blah, blah, blah. She brings me back in, stay on target, stay on, you know, on your topic. I do an incredible interview. It ended up on the cutting room floor. Once again, censored, censored by my feminists, my sisters. So... Have we made any progress? Not really, not really. Because I will say this, and I know you're all gonna get you know, the conspiracy theorist. The biggest conspiracy theorist on the planet is the US government. Boy, they are blowing smoke up our ass. They do not want women to become sexually independent. There goes a whole raft of free labor, ha! Huh. After the bulk of my life being based on censorship, 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 finally, the internet. I'm online, and I'm not being censored. This is going to make the big change in the world. Oh, I praise the goddess. Thank you for the internet, keeping it free. Keep it free. 
It is the most exciting thing. I know, I know I'm old and it's at the end of my life, but everything I say gets put out there. That's going to make a difference. And I have all of these kids. Oh, I love my kids. Writing in to me, Dr. Betty, baba da baba da baba da. The last one was, uh, am I going to be one of those women that just can't have an orgasm from intercourse? They don't go online. They don't go to the website. They don't get the information. I have to hold their little hand and say, honey, very few of us can have an orgasm from intercourse only. You have to learn about your body by masturbating and finding out how you function. Then you can share that with your boyfriend. But right now, if you think you're going to have your first orgasm from him penetrating, no. So as much as, as, much as the information goes out is how uninformed the, the world is. And we are in practically every country on the planet. If they've got electricity, Dodson and Ross, the website, we're there. It's an amazing thing in my mind. Millions of people can a- millions of people can access this information. It's it's all there. I have struggled a lifetime trying to find a business partner. I mean, it was it's, it's like looking for Mr. Right to get married, and it was like, oh, I'm never going. I had this woman and this woman and this woman and this guy and this guy and this guy. And I kept saying, i got to get the right business partner. I am still looking. I'm looking. And then when Eric, Eric was here for 10 years, I thought it was going to, oh, he's adorable and we have great sex, but he's not the business partner. So one day I get a phone call from this woman named Carlin Ross. And she says, um, I'd like to make an appointment with you and talk about, you know, I said, what are you doing? I'm doing podcasts. And at the podcast, what's a podcast? I wasn't quite sure what a podcast was. But it sounded like, you know, it's some new media, and I was certainly open for that. So I said, sure. So we made the date. She shows up a day early, and I go, oh, that's interesting. So I open the door, and, of course, I'm in my standard crummy little outfit. I think I had bicycle shorts and my T-shirt and sweatshirt or whatever it was. No, undershirt with Rosie the Riveter holding a, a Hitachi, holding a magic wand, Rosie. And here's this a very attractive woman. You know, and just very smartly dressed, and she and I said, "Oh, hi, I'm Carlin Ross." And I said, "Oh, we have an appointment tomorrow." And she said, "Oh, I'll come back." And I said, "No, you're here. Come on, come on in. You're here." So she comes in at this snappy, snap, snap, pulling this metal little case, and she goes in the and we set it up on the table. She opens it up and pulls out the computer, and then she's got these microphones and she sets them up, and I'm sitting there watching this. And I said, well, you seem to be very comfortable with technology. Oh, I love it. Anything mechanical, anything technical, anything computer, I'm on it. I love it. It's not, I, and I'm going, hmm. So I said, can you, uh, can you run a, do a camera? Can you do a, you know, oh, of course I can. She can do it. So I'm thinking, hmm, 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 hmm. And her ability to interview me was so far beyond anything. Usually when people come to interview me, it starts off like this. Well, tell me how you got into this work. Tell you how I got into masturbation? Yeah. Well, when I was five years old, (laughs) my mother didn't interfere. Oh, God, it's like the most dull, awful. So she comes in and she says, I went online and I found these quotes about you. And I'm just going to run a few of them by you. And I went, oh, this is nice. said, they have something online where they give people's quotes. I had never heard of this. I'm very interested. I want to go there and see what it is. And so she reads a quote. And I said, I never said that. And then I correct it. Then there's another one that was closer. But ah, no, that's not what I said. And it's just, it was, and we were off and running. So we were into this very enlightened vibrant conversation for about, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, and I'm saying, okay. And I just look at her, and I reach across the table, and I said, we're going to go into business together. Shake on it. I wanted her right then and there, and she reaches over and grabs my hand, and we shake, and I thought, whoa. So it turns out that she was looking (laughs) also for a partner. She was looking for an older woman who was involved in sexuality who was a feminist, She was the first woman that came to see me who identified as a feminist. Bingo. People had stopped using the word. Feminist was a dirty word. I continue to identify as a feminist, and I will die as a feminist. And so here comes this young woman 
who's a feminist, and she, I, and she labels it. She takes it on, and I went, we went into business. And 10 years later, we're doing great. So finally, I got my business partner. You know, I just think it's such a tragedy that Americans particularly cannot deal with death and dying. My mother died in, practically in my arms, and from that moment on, I thought, it's a really, it's a beautiful thing. It is like she, she said, Betty Ann, I'm not afraid to die. I've had a good life. And I said, I know, I know, Mother, you're, you're, you are fabulous. And she was surrounded by her, you know, her three remaining kids, and we just poured love on her, and I was with her her last month on earth. And she had cancer, and we would, she couldn't smoke anymore, but we'd, I'd give her the marijuana tea, and she'd been smoking pot for a while. I taught her how, and she loved it. She said, this is so much better than any of that medicine that the doctor gave me. And I said, I know. And to this day, at this age, I don't take any meds, but I still smoke dope. <laughs> so death is inevitable. And so I'm thinking about it this, well, I think, first of all, I'm not in a hurry, but I can certainly embrace death as the final orgasm. It's like, I've done everything. I mean, it just keeps getting better and better, but I will know when it's time to leave the planet, and I will do so very graciously. I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. I'm just going to slip away, because everything is already in place. I don't have anything left over. I don't have anyone that I owe an apology to. I don't have anyone that I owe money to. You know what I mean? It's like I'm clean and clear. I am so clean and clear. I can say, I love you all. Bye-bye.